weird to see my face on there. <laughs> Have you ever sat in a classroom and been told the difference between there, there, and there? And have you ever been told when you should use a semicolon versus a period, versus a comma, versus a hyphen, versus everything? What if I told you that those very same ideas about what the right language should look like can actually lead to language death and the mass extinction of languages that we see today? You see, everybody in this room shares something in common, and it's something that is as important to the human history as the invention of fire and the wheel. Any guesses? language. Big surprise. <laughs> Some people speak, others sign. Some languages include clicks, others are tonal. Some truly are ours, and some don't have any ours at all. But the ability to use language to communicate is what has gotten us as a species to where we are today, and it's also the cause of division. You see, every time we open our mouths, we say something new, a novel utterance never before heard. But at the same time, there's somebody out there deciding whether or not that utterance was correct. Now, in the field of linguistics, the scientific study of language, we don't really like the term correct, but for the rest of the normal human population, correct means what somebody at one point decided was the best or the right way to speak that language. Now, I'd like to ask you all a question. Who do you think decides what is right and what is wrong? Because usually it's the people in power. Historically, this meant colonial and imperial powers. This could be the British in North America or the Dutch in South Africa. And they overcome a smaller, less militarized group. And the language spoken by that smaller, less militarized group often becomes what's called the minority language. The language spoken by those in power is called the majority language. Now, how many people here by show of hands speak a language other than English? Okay, that's great. So, pretty much the entire room. Second question, how many of you speak a minority language? Okay, very significant less number of people. From Haida to Mi'kmaq, the Atlantic, to any of the 832 languages spoken in Papua New Guinea, the minority languages are actually the majority. Because you see, of the around 6,000 to 7,000 languages that are on Earth today, 23 to 30 of them account for more than half of the speaking population of Earth. And that 0.4% of languages are the only ones that get any sort of status or importance in the government and in politics. UNESCO states that 50 to 90% of the languages we have on Earth today face the risk of endangerment and extinction. Now, linguicide is the term that we use to discuss language death. The last speaker of Akabo, a language that was spoken in the Andaman Islands, died in 2010. And with her death, died Akabo. The world also lost the culture, the customs, the sounds, the music, and the language itself. Ayakneko was at the brink of death because the final two speakers just refused to talk to each other over a disagreement. <laughs> it's much more common than you think. And language diversity is something that's incredibly important. So, in Canada, we have a dialect known as Newfoundlandese, and when you hear Newfoundlandese, you can usually tell exactly on the map where they're from, and sometimes you might even have some sort of picture that comes to mind. <laughs> now, while well, Newfoundlandese itself, some people think is a little bit bad, it's not the best English, overall, it's a fun part of being Canadian, and it's an aspect that we like to joke around about. However, for a large majority of the world, those indigenous people across the globe, this is not the same story. Children nowadays who are indigenous open their mouth and English comes out as a result of seven generations of maltreatment and quieting. Residential schools took children from their homes and their communities and forced them to learn English. And it wasn't just bad to speak their native tongue, but it was often punishable. And the results of this are long-standing. 
There are people nowadays, families, generations, that can't communicate with one another. And there are elders to this day who are afraid to speak their mother tongue. And these are the languages that hold oral storytelling as an integral part of their community. Going to North America and the United States, African American English. Here we go. African American English has been seen as dirty and uneducated since it was created. And people have been trying to tell African Americans how they should be speaking the proper English. But the thing is, no one really talks about how intricate and complex African American English actually is. So in the blue here, we have something called the aspect marker, habitual aspect marker, which is fancy jargon for just the ability to express that something continuously happens, it frequently happens, it habitually happens. Now in English, standard English, we don't have this at all. But this is a feature that's common in most of the world's languages. And so just assuming that it's wrong because it sounds different is something we should probably avoid. Now, why should we defend diversity in languages? Well, when we think about diversity in the workplace, crucial. And when we think about diversity in ecosystems, we consider that crucial as well. But when it comes to language, not so much. And I want to do a little experiment with you guys. Imagine right now that whatever language or languages you speak are now forbidden. They're illegal. You can't speak them. From now on, you have to speak Martian. Okay? So what do you lose when this happens? Everyone in your community. If you go to class, you can't understand what they're talking about. You can't read your textbook. You can't function at work or read the signs on the wall or the posters on the street. You can't do anything. You can't even go on social media. Okay? You're completely isolated. You can't express what you want, what you need, and you can't express the deep thoughts that you have in your mind. Now, a friend of mine told me that language plays a role in how you see each other. And she said that she would never date a guy unless he could speak, read, and write in Arabic because it told her something about how he grew up and what his morals are. So when you tell somebody that the way they speak is wrong, it diminishes who they are as a person. So how do we move forward? It's been a lot of heavy talks right now. David Crystal, a British author and linguist, proposed 12 steps to fight the effects of language loss. They can be summarized mostly as supporting and funding revitalization efforts and making languages important not to just the people who speak them, but to everybody else. We need to get these languages in school systems because teaching kids and teaching the next generation how to speak is how we keep languages alive. And we need to understand that languages being cut off and being made forbidden have an effect on communities, both linguistically and culturally. Scottish Gaelic is a language that's indigenous to Scotland, surprisingly. And it's seen a lot of support in revitalization outside of Scotland itself. In fact, the website Duolingo, used for learning languages, offered a course in November of 2019 to learn Scottish Gaelic, and the results have been really incredible. Now, Duolingo itself has some questionable exercises. <laughs> okay. Not a fever dream. And in fact, in Duolingo by itself, 169,000 people are learning Scottish Gaelic, which nearly triples that of the native speaking population. This is how we get people excited to learn language. We don't make them rote memorize things and copy things from your Latin textbook in high school. We make it fun. We get you to remember what you've been doing. And you know what? It's not too late for languages we've already lost. Does anybody know what Hebrew is? Cool. I'm seeing some nodding. We love Hebrew. Hebrew, in spoken form, died out in 400 CE, but thanks to revitalization efforts in the 19th and 20th century, by 2013, there were 9 million speakers. Varangala, an indigenous language that was spoken in southern Australia until the 1960s, has been brought back to its community through workshops and mobile apps. Now, the Canadian census also showed some positivity. 
While the number of indigenous language speakers remains very low, the number of indigenous language learners has been increasing steadily. There are more indigenous language learners than there are native speakers. And this is a good thing because this shows people, this proves that people really want to actively learn these languages and they want them to come back and people are actively participating in cultures as just an everyday person to bring these languages back. You can just straight up learn a language. See, this is an app that was designed to teach Mi'kmaq, the indigenous language of Nova Scotia, where I'm from. And this is an app that was used to create or to teach Manx from the Isle of Man through folk songs. So you can go out and just try and learn a language, but if that's not your type, then we can start in here because we have to change how we think. Thinking about language diversity as a positive thing rather than an impediment to globalization. Not using phrases such as, you're in America, speak American. And that overall understanding that just because someone sounds different than we do doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong or any less so for what they've said. Now, social media. Let's talk about that for a second. It's a, it's a pretty big thing. Nowadays, with it as predominant as ever, it's important to decide who you want to be on social media. And using your language for the better is one of the best ways that you can do this. Okay. Supporting hashtags about people starting up new language revitalization acts. It's a great way to do that. There are estimates that show that every two weeks we lose another language. And by the year 2100, less than half of those 6,000 to 7,000 languages I mentioned earlier will even exist. So the time to act is now. I want you to think about what language means to you outside of English class from middle school. Think of what language might mean to somebody else, someone's community, and what might happen if you take language away from them. Giving a language status starts in here. If there's anything I can impart you with today, I want you to focus not on being the grammar police, but on policing the grammar.